Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are about to get started in this amazing panel, Exploring Black Experiences in Higher Education. Before we do so, I want to say thank you to all of you who are attending. Uh, this is an important conversation and we are delighted to have you present for this. And of course, I want to say thank you to the behind the scenes folk who are making sure everything runs smoothly and our stellar panel, I want to thank them uh, for being here and providing their expertise, their wisdom and their insight and basically the fuel for an amazing conversation. So a couple of housekeeping things, uh, unless you're speaking, please mute your mic uh, to limit other noises and you know whatever else may be happening in the wonderful Zoom uh, visual and audio environment. Also, uh, a couple of definitions. Uh, there may be some terms that the panelists use, so I want to make sure everyone's familiar with them. Uh, HBCU is a designation for historically black colleges and universities. It's a designation that has been recognized by the U.S. Department of Education and generally applies to schools that were in the business of educating specifically uh, black people before 1964. Uh, PWI is predominantly white institution, uh, and that's a designation that represents schools that have 50% or greater uh, white student enrollment. Uh, also, you may hear the term FGC, first generation college student, uh, which may be a term that comes up in our conversation. So without further ado, again, thank you very much. And I'd like to briefly introduce the panel. Uh, and give them the space to say a little bit more if they uh, choose to do so. So we have Dr. Tyra Gross uh, joining us on the panel, Rakia Hampton joining us on the panel, Jasmine Morell joining us on the panel, and I am the moderator. Uh, so please forgive me if I have mispronounced any names. Uh, I would love it if I can be corrected if that's the case, uh, but let's get started. Let's have a conversation and perhaps you can intertwine into your conversation, your experience with an HBCU. Uh, so on your screen, you can see a little bit of the background we're getting into in our conversation. And I'd really like for the panelists to kind of set us off with, you know, talking a bit about your personal experience. Uh, so this question is open to everyone on the panel uh, and hopefully we can hear from everyone. So please talk to us a little bit about your personal experiences with HBCUs. Hi, I'm, I'm jump in. Can y'all hear me okay? All right. Um, so I'm Dr. Tyra Gross. I'm an assistant professor of public health sciences at an HBCU, Xavier University of Louisiana, here in New Orleans. So I have personal experience on the faculty end of being at an HBCU, but actually something that's very near and dear to me is that when I was a rising senior in high school, my first job was as a summer student researcher at Southern University and A&M College in Baton Rouge, which is where I'm from. So my introduction to the world of research and my first paying job was at an HBCU. And so even though for my academic journey that I went to PWIs, LSU, LSU Health Science Center, University of Georgia, um, I will say that my mentor got me an HBCU for research experience and that I come from a family with a proud HBCU heritage, Grambling University and Southern University. And I have cousins that went to Howard and Clark. And um, so I actually wanted to go to an HBCU, but the scholarship offers that I received, um, I actually ended up at a PWI. So that's something that um, I hope to speak to a little bit later. Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Mariali and I am a alum at Howard University. Um, I attended Howard University from 2016 to 2020. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. Um, I found out about HBCUs during my high school senior year. One of my really close friends really wanted to go to Spelman. So with being from Atlanta, it was kind of up the street. So we would go and visit 
and just kind of get a feel for the lay of the land. But because it was so close to home, I ended up touring other schools and Howard just so happened to be one of them. Went for a freshman orientation, spring break week, fell in love and ended up attending. Um, it was one of the best decisions i made in my life today, I think I'd say. Um, so with that being said, I can't wait to get more into that experience and what it's led me to. But yes, I love my HBCU. Okay, I guess I'll talk a little bit. Um, so um, I'm Rakita and I didn't attend an HBCU. I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, similar to uh, Dr. Gross's reasoning. Uh, scholarship dollars were there for that. Um, but in my capacity at my previous job before working um, here at Packback, I um, worked as a high school administrator. So I tried to do a little bit of as, as I could to help drive those students to consider HBCUs when they were um, applying to different universities um, in their senior years as well. Thank you everyone for sharing your experience with HBCUs. And I also wanna point out that if you have questions, uh, we will be monitoring the chat. And so we hope to entertain those once we get to that part of our presentation. So you, you kind of touched on a little bit of this already. Um, and, and why you went there, but I wanna dig a bit deeper and ask, you know, before entering your chosen university, what was your perception of higher education? And if I could add just a little bit to that, what was your perception of HBC? So I'll say movie definitely played a large part. Um, I think the first movie that always comes to mind is Old School with Will Ferrell, where these like guys are going back to their alma mater and they're trying to like live it up and they're like binge drinking and it's just pure madness and craziness. So I think um, definitely kind of like, oh, college is going to be so much fun. You're going to study, but there's going to be like more fun and you're you're out on your own. So I think there definitely was this perception of just fun and independence. Um, and I think because of my family history uh, with um, some of my dad's siblings going to Gramlin and some going to Southern uh, HBCU tailgates and HBCU football and uh, my dad's a Q-Dog or a mega sci-fi fraternity. So uh, having kind of like Greek life in mind and, and all of these things. So academics, I didn't really start thinking about academics until probably senior year was like, OK, we actually pick a major and you go to college and you study something. Um, so I think once, uh, you know, it was towards the, the latter end of junior year and senior year, starting to think more about not just the college experience, but what was the academic uh, journey that I wanted to pursue um, and which schools were going to actually uh, fit that. Uh, hi, everyone. So for me, um, I can say that uh, starting my education experience, I went into college thinking that it was a place for me to go get my education so I can leave, make some money and live my best life. Um, but I can say with going to Howard and going to my HBCU, it went from something that was a one track mind goal to get to that desired ending that I wanted. And it turned into something that I created friendships for life, like my professional development flourished. Um, and as a person, I can say that it accelerated my, accelerated my growth completely. So what turned into like a money-minded track to try to kind of hurry up and get to the career that I wanted, ended up just being like this four years of being in an incubator that just kind of grew me in a way that I didn't know that I needed to grow. Um, so it started off in one thing, but it kind of went to another, and I'm thankful for that. Um, for me, I didn't really think about college too much, honestly. Um, obviously, I'd seen it on TV, and I knew that that was something that students did and was kind of a logical next step after high school. But it really wasn't until um, getting into high school and having an amazing high school uh, college counselor, Dr. O'Reilly. She's here. Hey, Dr. O. Um, and having her like really just position that as something that I should want to do, that I could do, and then helping me along the process 
made it something that was a lot more realistic um, and definitely influ influenced me ultimately going on and doing that. Well, these are some really amazing experiences and you're highlighting some of the things that come up in the literature in terms of support, uh, feeling a sense of belonging and having someone in your corner who, who is going to that you're flying up success. So along with that, um, what were some unique experiences that you had as students? And then Dr. Gross, if you could follow up um, with your experience as an educator. Okay, so to start, one of my unique experiences as a student um, was my education was definitely tailored to prepare me for the real world. Um, in our freshman year, we have this thing called business orientation where we get corporate sponsors. And those corporate sponsors can be like Eli Lilly, Google, Johnson & Johnson, and they send a representative to our campus um, for the full semester. And we do business prep, they do resume prep. We go over what it means to present and how to be a better business professional. We wear suits every Tuesday and Thursday. And it was like a whole thing, it was a whole show. Um, but in that, I learned what it means to be professional and what it means to be Black. Um, I often thought it meant having to muddle some of myself to try to assimilate to what I thought corporate America was. But with having people who looked like me in those experiences, in those major companies that I looked up to, it really changed my idea on what it means to take my career by the reins and kind of just take charge of what I want to do. Um, so now hindsight 2020, I see that it really just empowered me to just be myself and do the things that I want to do and not having to change who I am at my core to try to fit into what I sh believe I should be. Um, it was a great experience. And I believe everyone who experiences our business orientation course, it definitely tailors us and molds us in a way that I don't think I could have gotten anywhere else so soon. Um, so for me, going to a predominantly white institution and even more so a, a campus that's a bit segregated, if I'm being honest, um, it was a little shocking initially. Um, and I'm from Chicago and Chicago is a very segregated city, so I don't know why, but it was. I think over the four years that I went there, I really gained to understand, I really started to really understand like the importance of representation in a way that I never really thought about it growing up in the Austin neighborhood of Chicago, which is a predominantly black neighborhood. I never had to think about representation because I was just surrounded by people who were like me. But then going onto that college campus and seeing that I wasn't surrounded by people who looked like me and even less so inside of the actual classroom and in academic spaces, um, it made me want to be a part of academia myself, um, but even more so to create this sense of representation that I could take back to the kids in my neighborhood who I grew up with or the students that I ultimately started to work with um, at the high school that I worked with before. So really just like building that fire uh, within me. So I'm sorry, I'm having a some tech, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, maybe it's just just an illusion. Um, at first, I want to say, as an educator on this panel, I want to give uh, claps and shout outs to the fellow educators for logging in, most likely on your lunch break, because we have been Zoomed, any meeting, Google Meet, all these things. We're so over some of it. And so I just really appreciate people showing up for this conversation today because I just think that it's a very timely discussion. But um, I just wanted to show some love that I'm sure many people have just come from a virtual meeting and are headed to another virtual meeting. So I appreciate you being here. Um, as an educator, I will say the reason that I wanted to be at an HBCU is I kind of earned my teaching stripes at University of Georgia as a graduate TA. And some of the students that I connected with right away with having a, a sea of predominantly uh, white students were students who were black and brown. And I noticed that because I noticed them, how much more they showed up 
Because I remember being the student that's like the brown face in the sea of white faces. And uh, when I was seen, you know, like at my core, when I was seen and valued and and pulled to the side and, and given extra resources or opportunities that made me feel like I belonged, even though, you know, I was at a majority um, institution. And so uh, I really started to bond with some of the students and even for my students that were not uh, from Black descent or from um, a racial ethnic minority background, when I knew their names and they just felt like they were numbered because at Georgia, even as a graduate TA, my largest class was by myself was like 110 students. And I had athletes in there, y'all. I had all, I had a little bit of everything. Um, students who needed um, like extra test time all in this one class and it was just me. So I had to grow up really quickly. Um, but when I did, Student Athletics at Georgia approached me about working with the athletes over the summer as a mentor. And so I think because I was a mentor that looked like those young men, they responded to me a different way. And I could talk to them a certain way that I didn't have to feel like I had to code switch. And code switch basically means for those of y'all that are like code switch, what's that? What is code switching? Uh, code switch just means maybe in, you know, when you're with your family or you're with your, the people you grew up with, you talk a certain way in different settings, we kind of, uh, and sometimes it's just subconscious how we, we, we shift our mannerisms. Uh, we shift our body language and our speech and our dialects based on uh, who we're around. And I was, I did not like teaching such large classes. So it's like, okay, well, I want to teach students that that see themselves in me. I want to have smaller class sizes. And I didn't want uh, the pressure of being around like, we have to research, you have to research and you better write this grant. And then it's like, well, I, I actually want to have that, that time um, to build relationships with students. Like I, I enjoy that. I don't mind that. Like they helped me learn more about myself. They challenged me with their questions. So I wanted to be in an environment where I felt like, um, yes, I can do my scholarship, but that I can also um, pass the torch to the next generation. And, and many times as an educator, we may, so I'll, I'll use my nutrition class. We may start off talking about nutrition and then we have a side conversation on just something that students are really dealing with. So the psychosocial um support that I can just like weave into the classroom and I don't just have to keep it lecture, 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 do this activity, turn in your homework, um, I think is fulfilling for me. Thank you. And you're really highlighting some things that are an important part of the conversation. Uh, because, you know, as an educator, obviously as a student, there's more going on than just what's in the classroom. And so having who understands that and, and can speak to you in a way that's helpful um, uh, for people who are looking to uh, continue their education. Uh, universities are starting to understand uh, is that you know that first year is so critical, uh, and a lot of focus on students, which it should be. I would say also we have to think about underrepresented faculty. You know, what is their experience at a hostile space? Their tenured uh, scholar. Are they being supported? Are they being nurtured? Because it's difficult to fill from an empty cup. So a lot of educators sometimes are trying to fill from an empty cup. So you really highlight the importance of having a supportive, nurturing environment. Uh, and I'm sure that a lot of students already know that having mentors doesn't stop when you graduate. Uh, you, you want mentors throughout your, your life and people who can sort of see, I, I know where you're going and here are some pieces of information, some wisdom from my experience that can assist you in this particular process. And in some cases, uh, those students and those professors end up working together on projects, on papers. So uh, it's a win for everyone involved. So I do want to talk a little bit about the myths. Uh, so there are a number of myths about HBCUs. There's the conversation of the quality of education, uh, the quality of staff, faculty, and so let's let's talk about that. Let's put that out and start to deal with uh, what are the myths, what is the reality, and talk to us a little bit about that. So I want to start with the student perspective, and then end with uh, Dr. Gross.
So from a student perspective, um, I can definitely say, okay, well, starting with the backstory, when I first told a lot of my family, um, specifically, like, I want to go to an HBCU, they kind of questioned um, not necessarily the quality of education, but the diversity of experience that I would be lacking with choosing an HBCU over another university. Um, and I can say that once getting to Howard, um, it's th that's not an issue at all. Um, I think there's a frequent assumption that um, Black people, African Americans are a monolith, which is essentially saying that what you see in one, you see in another and another and another which is yes. far from the truth. Um, and based on that assumption, I think that a lot of people assume that the education experience would lack diversity. And that's far from the truth. Like at Howard, um, there's so many cultures, so many people, there's diversity of thought, so many qualities that you get that is similar or a little different to a PWI. Um, and then not only in that, but because the education is taught by um, professors and administrators who look like you are feel for your struggle, it's almost like the career or the curriculum was like tailored to seeing me as an individual excel and not just hit certain scores and numbers, even though that does matter. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would say one myth that I knew of um, or just one thing that I was told and I didn't attend an HBCU um, was about, you know, like the amount of financial aid and scholarships that are available to students who um, would want to attend and that there's more of that available at uh, PWIs. Thank you. And, and before Dr. Cro Dr. Gross jumps in, I just wanted to underscore uh, that a number of challenges that students have is, is about belonging. Uh, I know we've talked about it already, uh, but so much of the literature about student experiences is centered on, you know, I didn't feel like I was a part of the university or I had to be the representative for the black race in all of my classes. Uh, so I think it's really important for us to understand that for many students, uh, it's not a question of intellectual ability. It's not a question of uh, the will or desire, uh, it has a lot to do with belonging in some instances. So uh, thank you, uh, Jasmine, for highlighting the importance of that about experience and then also sharing uh, some of the myths uh, around that. And you touched on something maybe we, we could return to is the perception of HBCUs uh, in a number of Black communities, not all, uh, but the idea that, you know, there's somehow some deficiency with you attending uh, said school. Uh, Dr. Gross, please. To that point, um, I think what's interesting is being from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where you have a PWI and an HBCU um, that are pretty sizable within the same city. It's interesting to see how those dynamics play out locally. Um, so in some circles, oh, well, what school you're you're going to? Oh, I'm going to go to LSU. Oh, you didn't want to go on the yard? You didn't want to go on Southern? It's like, whoa, whoa. You, you, you don't understand like the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the application process, the, the decisions that the family had to sit down and, and make together. Um, because let's be honest, these are 17 and 18-year-old uh, new adults or like really old older children that are making these life-changing de decisions. And that's a lot of pressure, um, especially when you when you consider like uh, the student loan application, the finance, the, the financial piece of that. Um, just to be honest, like in my family, my dad had a, a chronic gambling addiction. And so for us, that was a major part into like why you're going to go to LSU because ROTC says, you will have this money and you will have this perk and here's free money for books and here's a stipend. You won't have to work. So it's like, but I don't want to go here. I've told y'all my whole life, I don't want to go to LSU. And now you're saying I'm going to go to LSU. So one thing that I would say are myths are that um, one, just because you see uh, students of color at PWIs um, is, you know, all of these resources are around. That doesn't mean that they uh, know how to navigate all of those resources or that they feel um, 
supported. There may be supports, but that doesn't mean that they feel supported. And the example that I'll share is because I got a D in human physiology, which I'm still a little bit salty about. Um, I was in the computer lab at the beginning of the summer semester and a young lady said, oh, that class is hard. Like, you know, and this was one of my white peers in um, the major of dietetics. So I'm like, oh man, like human physiology is going to be hard. Fast forward at the end of the semester. Well, how did it go on human physiology? Yeah, I'm going to end with a D. And she's like, you didn't know about the test banks? Sis, test banks? Yeah, there's like a whole test bank thing. Like you didn't know about this? You told me the class was hard, but you didn't mention anything about there being this test bank stockpile somewhere. Um, and I consider myself not first generation, but my, I, you know, my elders didn't go to a PWI. So navigating that size of a school, even though I'm from that very town, I think um, uh, was met with some frustration um, in, in, in some of the courses and navigating some of the departments. And so I think also um, to my fellow panelists point about black not being monolithic, um, seeing the, the international student experience on HBCUs or seeing how you have students that are like fifth generation HBCU, uh, you know, born and bred and are a true first generation student that maybe has Pell and lots of other things and really still does not know how to navigate higher higher education. So just because they're around many more faces, they may not feel like they belong culturally because they're from Jersey and they're in New Orleans or they're from Cali and you know they're in Georgia. So I think um, belonging and supports can look differently in, in different students uh, based on their background uh, can feel like they belong or can feel like they are supported or vice versa. Thank you so much. You know, it's interesting because we're at a moment uh, given on heightened issues around uh, anti-Blackness in particular, we're seeing a number of promising student athletes choosing HBCUs and students in general saying, you know what, I think this is an option for me. Uh, and there's something uh, that's come up in the chat I wanted to sort of talk about, and this is notion of the hidden curriculum. Uh, we unpack what that is and then how different professors can help students navigate that. Uh, that's a great uh, question. You know, I think that you all are in prime position to give us some key insight. Uh, so why don't we go in reverse? Uh, Dr. Gross, could you start us off and we'll uh, end with student perspectives on this? Can you define specifically what you mean by hidden curriculum? Because I want to make sure that to the person's question that I'm answering it correctly. Because when makes I'm sense, here, I'm thinking like, oh, is that the, the hidden test banks that I just talked about? Like, there, <laughs> there, is that what's hidden? Um, so I just want to make sure that uh, I know what they mean by that that phrasing. Okay. Yeah. So. Let, why don't we do this? Uh, the person who raised this question, can you um, put a little bit more detail on that, exactly what you mean? Because in my mind, I'm thinking about like Robin D.G. Kelly and, you know, those those hidden scripts in which people operate. And that may not be the question. Um, so we'll circle back to that once they've had an opportunity to um, add a little bit more to that particular question. Uh, so I appreciate, you know, that idea um, in terms of thinking about, you know, what's happening that people may not be aware of, but those test banks, um, that, that seems to be a thing. So we may have to have a, another moment to entertain that. So here's a good question. There are a number of people who are considering school and, you know, are about to make a major decision. Uh, so what would you tell a student um, about you know, faculty at your school or your experience and why they should attend an HBCU or what's the value of a PWI. So let's let's start with a student perspective and then Dr. Gross, if you would uh, follow up. Um, so I, I'd like to start here a little bit. Um, so I think one thing that, that I would want to say to students is that I think there's such a focus on just the academic piece uh, when we talk about higher education and just like, you know, making sure that you get good grades and that you, um, you know, pass your tests and those things. And those things are very important. 
Um, but I don't think we set students up to really understand like the social piece of attending a, a predominantly white institution um, and how it is, it can be shocking to, you know, have to navigate these spaces and to feel like you're on 100% of the time. And when I, when I say like on, I feel like, I don't know how to explain that in a way that's, you might understand, but it's just like you always just have to put your best foot forward in everything that you do. Um, but then also with that being said, it's like where I think uh, Dr. Kill did speak on this, where it there is this sense that you have to represent your culture um, in all of the spaces that you go to and that you're kind of a representative of what you're talking about. And I would say just spending a little bit of time, like creating a community around yourself um, of people that you identify with or that you feel comfortable with outside of the classroom so that when it does get overwhelming and when it feels like, oh man, I'm going into this space and I don't know what someone's going to say and I don't know how I'm going to respond to it if they say something that's like, you know, weird or uh, racially charged, that you have this safety space that you can then go to. So I would say to all mm -hmm. of the Black students who are attending or are planning to attend PWIs, definitely try to, to find that. So almost similar to Rakita's experience, um, 100%. Um, someone I would tell a prospective student who wanted to go to Howard, I was considering that as an option, was that it'll sometimes be unnecessarily hard. Um, when you're at a high performing school, you find that you often have to do well with your academics, you have to be social, and then you also have to have that personal time too, just to kind of ground yourself. So in that, my biggest piece of advice would be get three mentors. So like a peer, um, an adult you trust, and a family member. Um, because there were times at Howard where I needed my father or my mother to advocate for me to administration regarding financial aid, because I was in class getting ready for a test and I couldn't be at two places at once. Um, and financial aid discrepancies is something that happens at HBCUs. Um, it's definitely something that is talked about a lot and it's true. Um, definitely something that that realm of education should definitely work on. But because of that, it's so important to have a village that is supporting you, which is something that was mentioned earlier. So definitely, yeah, having a strong support system because it will definitely get you through. Um, I can agree with um, her comments about sometimes it, it being hard. So what I like to tell students when, um, and, and this is prospective students, uh, new uh, freshmen first week is time management, self-care, uh, healthy habits. Um, there are healthy ways to study and there are destructive ways to study. There are healthy ways to socialize and there are destructive ways to socialize. And so I think uh, it's not uncommon at Xavier to see students studying before the semester begins because they're trying to they're trying to legit like get a head start on some of their STEM uh, curriculum. So I think having uh, just helping students understand that you know, it's doable, it's doable. Um, and also kind of taking the pressure off uh, when they pick majors, why, um, and I'm an aspiring life coach, y'all. So I, I like to ask students like, well, why, why that major? I wanna help people. Well, there's tons of majors that you can help people. Um, what is it that you specifically like about um, medicine? Well, da, 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 da. it's like, OK, well, have you looked at medical school curriculum? Will they cover that more? So I just really try to um, for prospective students, help them to to save them some stress and, and drama later on by uh, saying like, OK, well, if you're really interested in this major, does this school really offer that? Because you may make great friends here uh, and then feel torn later on. Um, because you want to transfer because your major or what you want to do is really not really not here. So I think helping prospective students just really talk about fit. Like I think there's a fit for every student that desires to go to higher education. Um, and if you do the 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 discovery with them in the beginning of uh, which campuses do you see as really truly being a fit where you could be happy because it's warmer there. You don't have to have these anoraks and 
and thermals and all these things like, you know, uh, the food that you like culturally, you can find that, that uh, there's water nearby. So when you need a break, you know, if what being close to the beach is important, I, I just think that uh, so much is made off of, um, oh, well, I'll make this much money later on. It's like, okay, but this is four to five years of your life now. And also talking to students about the majority of students don't finish in four years anymore because they're burning themselves out trying to catch up or they're retaking classes and they're so stressed. And it's like, yes, the paper may say four year degree, but let's be honest for, for the average person, it's taking them summers to, to still do that or to retake courses or so let's, let's be a little bit flexible. So I think just talking to them about like, you know, like you're welcome here is hopefully this is a good fit here or some success strategies. So I'm um, just having some, uh, some uh, real talk about Let's not just make this like an emotional investment because this is a financial investment and a time investment that you're making um, to be here. You outlined a number of really important points in this particular journey. And one of the things I think about is the relationship between faculty and students. Uh, that, that's so critical. And there was a comment in the chat that uh, encouraged students to attend office hours. That is so important. Uh, depending upon your high school experience, you may be uncomfortable with having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an educator. Uh, however, once you're in college, you know, that's something that is strongly encouraged. I have a number of students, and I imagine, Dr. Gross, maybe you have a similar experience who I, I never see. And I say to them, you know, why, why not show up for office hours? And their response is, oh, I didn't know I could just go. And so one of the things I encourage is that, yes, attend. Even if you just want to say, hello, my name is, I did X, Y today in relationship to your class, um, just to begin to develop that relationship. Who knows, that may be someone you can call on for a reference letter or someone who can encourage you to attend a conference in your particular discipline. discipline. So uh, those relationships are important and those are the building blocks for success once you exit the university. So here's a here's a tough question, I imagine, um, based on the, the great experiences that you all have talked about on your educational journey. Uh, what experience uh, impacted you the most as a student? And, you know, kind of wrapped into that is what is one thing you would change about your college experience? So it's kind of um, questions at the opposite end. Uh, so let's start with Rakia and then we'll move to, to uh, Jasmine on this one. <laughs> Yeah, um, I would say, ooh, this is, that is this is a tough question. There's a lot of things. Um, probably what impacted me the most was realizing in my junior year, um, and I didn't. I consider myself a first generation uh, college graduate, so it took me a while to like really understand the ins and outs of like how everything really worked. But by my junior year, I felt like I had it. And then I was able to curate my my schedule to give me what I needed. Um, yes, to take the classes that I needed to take, then also to just take classes that I didn't need to, but just because I wanted to, because they were being taught by you know black teachers that I wanted to study under, or we're talking about cultural things that I identified with that I wanted to learn more about, um, even though it didn't have anything to do with my major per se. Uh, and that I think really helped for me to just kind of realize the space that I was in um, and the privilege that I had being in that academic space to shape um, not only my learning, but the learning of the other students in that classroom, um, instructors as well, and feeling a sense of pride around that. Um, it took a while to get there, but once I did, I was very, very excited. Oh, and then I guess one thing that I would change, I didn't, um, I didn't join a sorority and I wish that I would have, um, so if I could go back and do things over, I would, I would pledge, uh, my first year. I'm sure there's somebody in the chat saying it's not too late. <laughs> Tell me how. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, uh, and it's actually funny that we've asked this question considering the conversation that we just had regarding like mental health and uh, higher education. So my senior year, I took 44 credits and it, it drained the life out of me. Um, I hadn't been out of school for 
a year yet. And I'm still like recovering from the stress that I underwent my senior year, just trying to say, I want to finish in my four years. So I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Um, and so the mental gymnastics that it, that required, like it was too much. Um, post-grad, I can say that it definitely taught me to respect my boundaries, one mental and physical. Um, and that's translated into my career because um, it's allowed me to say, okay, this is how much I can perform in my nine to five, but I still need to have some room left over for myself at the end of the day. And with me being the type of person that I am, if I hadn't experienced that uh, senior year commotion, I think I would be overextending myself. Um, and there are ways to overperform, but still save some space and some room for yourself. Um, and I definitely learned that. Um, one thing I would change about my college experience outside of taking 44 credits, honestly, I would just say don't be shy. Uh, I know for me, I was able to meet a lot of people, made a lot of friends that I'll have for a lifetime. I think that there are some experiences that I missed out on um, because I was fearful of putting myself out there. Hindsight, I'm realizing that other people were shy too. It wasn't just me. So yeah, with that being said, definitely just put yourself out there. Or for me, that's what I would change. Thank you. And, and these are really good. These aren't like surface uh, comments. So I appreciate you all really sharing how you're feeling and you know your process. I think oftentimes we have like our onstage persona, which is not as real as what's going on. So when you talked about those those hours, I'm thinking to myself, uh, there are graduate students who would struggle with that load. Um, so I appreciate it. that someday I'm going to take care of you like you. So you have to ensure that your mental, physical, emotional, spiritual needs are a top priority in addition to the other things that you want to do. And as many of us know, having gone through this process, it's you that's going to fuel all those other things that you want to do. Or the other things that you want to do. So I appreciate your, your insight. Uh, so I suppose now the tables have turned to the professor question. Uh, so here are the questions. Uh, Dr. Gross, we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, how do your teaching practices reflect the diversity of your students? And what changes do you hope to see for future generations of Black students? So I will say that um, my teaching practices are definitely, I, I consider myself as someone that follows student-centered pedagogy. And because my background is in public health and we're living in a pandemic, so perfect time to always talk about public health, right? Um, it's just really bringing in examples and kind of also encouraging uh, from the first week of class to get to gauge student interest so that I can weave in things that um, those in the current class that semester are interested in. Um, and just continue to do that throughout the semester. But I will say in terms of diversity, if we think about it demographically, being at um, Xavier, um, the majority of our students are young black female. And so it's it's easy for me to build rapport. Actually, uh, a story that I meant to say later is my experience when I first started Xavier, I was pregnant with my my oldest son and many people thought I was a pregnant student. Um, and so it really gave me empathy for the young women. It's like the way that people would look, I'm like, I'm a, pro I'm a professor, but what were you thinking? Cause it probably wasn't, it probably wasn't. So just kind of like coming into myself. So I can definitely uh, share that with my students, like, you know, just own who you are, you're here in whatever capacity. And, um, but I say that I also try to help the students, not just uh, think about, um, black issues, but think about how black issues connect to other cultural groups. And so sometimes if we're doing a case study in class, I'll, um, you know, maybe include an indigenous population or Latinx population or um, say low income, but not specify race, but ask them, who did you picture? Why did you picture that? Do you know about poverty demographics in America? It's not, it's not just 
just black, maybe with the news. So trying to channel some of the internalized racism that some of them have and also broaden their perspective to not just only, you know, they, they came to HBCU for a certain experience, but also try to help them to be global citizens. So one thing for myself, I encourage them to study abroad and, and Lord willing, when this pandemic is, is gone. Um, but I do try to encourage students to get outside of their comfort zone in terms of being in America and and looking and learning from from other cultures, because that was an experience I didn't have until I was in my doctoral program. Um, so one thing. So something that I hope to see for future generations of uh, black students is definitely kind of like a more global mindedness or global connection or just just this ability to be like, you know what? I, I'm just going to go for it because um, I think that there's a lot of, of hesitation um, and a lot of, of fear, rightfully so, because there's a lot of different things going on. But just just hoping to instill hope and courage like you won't know you have this one life to, like, to go for it if you're not satisfied in this major. If, uh, for example, having uh, conversations with students like if you're not happy in public health, if you want to do something else, I will write you the letter of recommendation to transfer. I will help you get connected to the, the right department because I just want you to feel like you're finding your fit. Um, so just really for students to to find their fit, find their belonging, to to live courageously and to just leave their mark in the world. That's that's what I hope for the current generation and uh, for future generations that they uh just own who they are and own their space. Thank you. You know, I, I would echo a number of your thoughts. Uh, and, you know, I, to respond to the diversity question, I think I have to consider the fact that I have gay and lesbian as well as trans students in my class. I have students who are first generation college students. I have students who are seeing the first black professor in their life, maybe teacher ever. So I think that I have to really think about the different uh, pedagogical approaches that I use and also just connecting with students. Uh, so fortunately, I teach uh, in the Department of African American Studies. So, you know, one of the things that Asante and others say is that no one is more uh, multicultural than us. So I think part of that as a discipline, you're, you're already thinking in that mode. But I also want to be intentional about recognizing uh, the varying diversities that exist in my classroom. Um, there are students who have different abilities. So I want to acknowledge that. So I try to switch up my game, so to speak. So I don't want to be over-reliant on PowerPoint. Sometimes I tell stories. Uh, sometimes I try to do some things that are more interactive. So that, uh, there's a, at least an attempt to engage with the different learning styles that are present. And my hope for uh, changes of generations of future generations is, you know, I'm pretty much echoing Dr. Gross. I want them to see themselves in the spaces that they like to be. I also would encourage students um, to not be afraid of you know, their blackness. Uh, I think a number of students feel like they have to shrink. Uh, not just them, you know, there are certain institutional forces sometimes that make you feel like that. And so I want to do that. Um, and don't be afraid of African American studies, I have to say that. I would strongly encourage them uh, to see them, you know, whether you're in business, whether you're in, you know, one of the STEM fields, visualize yourself. In, uh, so I know we have some questions uh, from our audience. So I definitely want to uh, make sure we have time for that. This is such an important conversation. And so I imagine that people have questions that maybe we didn't necessarily touch on. Uh, so. Let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of the things that um, our audience is asking about. I will often ask me, uh, what was college like? Was it like the yard? Was it like, you know, any of these other movies? Uh, and so I'll, I'll add my two cents. I am a proud graduate of an HBCU, Clark Atlanta University, and I can speak to the other side. You know, one of the things that attracted me to the HBCU was the variety of political and social experiences. Uh, the first African uh, sorority, for lack of a better word, Offset, was founded at Spelman College. Uh, and I hadn't seen anything like that in my life. Uh, unapologetically African women who were embracing it and moving in a way that I was like, wow, um, I have never seen this in my life. Um, and, I, and I should mention 
uh, the first African fraternity, Kemet Asin, uh, was also founded uh, in the AUC Atlanta University Center. So I saw people who, you know, for instance, uh, had a Pan-African philosophy. I saw people who were Baha'i, people who were Christian, who were Muslim. Um, and these were Black people from all over the world. I had a classmate who was from Bermuda. Uh, so, so the notion that if you go to an HBCU, everybody is the same. Uh, during my orientation week, that was quickly smashed, uh, meeting people from a variety of spaces and political ideological positions uh, was amazing. Um, and then just being in Atlanta, uh, I wouldn't change that for the world. So uh, yeah, the question that I get a lot of since it's Atlanta is, oh, was it, was it like this movie? I was like, no, not really. Uh, and then recognizing that my experience is not the universal black college experience. So, you know, it really depends on what you're into and the kind of things that you want to engage in socially, politically. Uh, but a lot of the stuff you see in those films was not my experience. Um, I got an opportunity to work with some really amazing activists in the local community, uh, people who were organizing. And so it it just, it was home. Uh, I guess that's the best way to put it. So um, let's return to that conversation before about the hidden curriculum. Uh, it really uh, piqued my interest about what they meant by that. And so... Uh, this is a good opportunity if you're still uh, in the conversation. We'd love to hear more about um, what you mean by that. So as those questions are rolling in, uh, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. So uh, Jasmine, having graduated recently from HU, uh, which I'm sure people are really excited because uh, um, the vice president also is an alum from there in addition to a number of other people, the late great Chad with Bozeman as an example, Thurgood Marshall, the list goes on. Uh, that has to be an extreme source of, of pride to know that I walk the halls, that these same people walk the halls. Do you think that gives you a boost or is it just kind of one of those things that's like, yeah, this was fun. They did this and now I'm doing it. Um, I could say it definitely gave me a boost um, and it encouraged me to want to be the best self that I can be because all of those who went to Howard and have done great before me, they were just being the best that they could be. So it just really encouraged me to want to just put my best foot forward in my career and take charge of the things that I want in my life because there are people who look like me who've done it successfully. So that doesn't mean that I can't do it. And because I went to a school like Howard, it's almost the legacy is almost instilled in you upon freshman year. You get there and the first thing you hear about is all those greats. And they often visit and come back and try to like show their face, which is also good. So the humility of it all is very grounding, but it also definitely helps me propel myself forward in life. Excellent. Thank you so much. And here's, here's a question uh, for Rakita, who I think is um, being encouraged to do some of the things she wanted to do in the chat. So that's exciting. We're making connections. Uh, could you all talk about what what is it like? Um, two questions. Uh, and, and I think you can tell who these questions are for. So having recently graduated, what do you think your experiences would have been like had you attended an HBCU? Um, and is there a potential that you may attend one for graduate school? And then uh, next question, what is it like being You've addressed some of this already, but what's it like as a member at an HBCU, um, having had the undergraduate experience uh, at a PWI? Um, I think for me, um, I if like I I was happy about the in, the school that I attended. It's the it's the school I wanted to go to, and I you know had a great opportunity to be able to go there on a full ride. So I'm you know very appreciative. But honestly, it was a little lonely, um, and I didn't really realize that until after I had left that space. Um, and lonely in the sense that yes, I had friends and people that I hung out with, but I just always felt like I had to put my best foot forward all the time. Um, and I just wanted to like sometimes have the like crazy college experiences that you see people have on TV and me having to weigh that and say like, 
well, well, what will people think if I, you know, I'm doing that? I still did it, but I also had to like think about it and almost police myself a little bit more than I think I would have had to go into an um, HBCU. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Gross, uh, what, what, what's your experience like uh, teaching at a, an at HBCU? Well, I think if we had uh, football, it would be uh, it would be different. So um, being at an HBCU that is known for kind of being in the upper echelon in terms of like, oh, you know, uh, we send a lot of students on to become black doctors. And um, that branding attracts a lot of students that are um, interested in going in into medicine. And some have been prepared by high school uh, for our curriculum, and some have not been prepared um, at all and are given, you know, like the chance of a lifetime to, to see how it goes. Um, so I think just being a professor at an HBCU, I actually, if I can be, I'll be uh, vulnerable with y'all. I was crying to my mama yesterday because one of my graduating seniors went into preterm labor and she texted me while she is in labor on the the peanut ball asking if i could talk so i'm like oh girl you want to talk to me you in labor your man is there why you want to talk to me <laughs> and so i'm like talking to her and you know my background is maternal and child health in terms of um research but i also am a mom of, of three littles and i had a baby during the pandemic myself so more recently i have navigated you know maternity care during covid so I think she just she just wanted wanted some encouragement. And um, so then I called my mom and I was just like, mom, we got to pray for her. I just like she called me out of all people. Where's her own mama? She's talking to. Her. So but I, I think um, there I definitely have some stories of um, students that I had uh, a more of a mentoring relationship with. Um, there are some students that I was like, oh, you know, I'll try to give them like the. Uh, the hidden curriculum of let's talk about this and let's talk about that. And they just like sign this form. That's all I'm here. Just sign my form, ma'am. I don't need the sprinkles. Just, just sign the form. Um, and then there are others that are really craving that additional, like, can you help me navigate some of these things? Like I have these questions about, you know, uh, politics or whatever, or uh, relationships, my, you know, uh, drama back home. And so uh, definitely, uh, the, the field calls it other mothering, right? So kind of like wearing this mothering hat for people who are not your um, And so coming into Xavier, starting my career as I was also entering motherhood, I was like, man, it's, I guess they picked me. I guess they picked me. So I think that's also part of my pedagogy is, is re recognizing um, and my students were tweeting about this in the fall that Dr. Gross' philosophy is that everybody is somebody's baby. And so when I see that student, I try to really see that student. And then when I see the class, try to recognize that like, hey, I, I, I see you, like, let's all engage, let's all be here if we're gonna be here. Um, but I would just say that trying to make connections with students so they feel like they belong. Because sometimes it, that's that's the, the biggest difference, right? Is someone, you feel like somebody really saw you. So for my sister that, you know, was saying that if she went back, you know, she would want to feel less lonely, you know, what if someone had really, you know, pulled you to the side and like, I see you. And, and, and sometimes it's just, it's not Absolutely. necessarily yeah. long ongoing relationship, but just you see a student, you smile and you wave. Um, I know we talked to Xavier more recently about radical hospitality. So just just creating a, a culture where you acknowledge others and you see them uh, for the beautiful human being that they are and just just acknowledging them that you're in the shared space. Uh, Thank you, them. Dr. Gross. Thank you. Uh, and I, I hate to do this because we got a fire question. Um, how do you navigate and grapple with the white gaze that plagues a lot of academia uh, in terms of the literature? That is a great question. But unfortunately, we are at time. Uh, I'll, maybe there's another conversation. Uh, who knows? 
where we could get into that. But thank you so much to everyone who's attended. I know people had to leave for other meetings, but we are grateful and thankful for your your contribution to this conversation. And we are definitely grateful for the wisdom of this panel. Uh, they've given us a lot to think about and some really good insight on their experiences. And thank you to the folks at Packback for hosting this event. And hopefully we'll come back to address that question. I'm so excited about that question, but I know we're at time. So thank you everyone on the panel. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience and have a good day.